So, Father, I thank you and I praise you with all of my heart, Lord. Lord, I ask you for guidance and direction. I ask, Lord, that your Holy Spirit would lead us, Lord, where we need to be. And, Lord, that we would truly, Lord, just shine for you. May your word strengthen us this morning, Lord. May your Holy Spirit just open up our mind and heart to receive this word. And, Father, rebuke every demonic power that has come against your church today. Lord, we ask you, Lord, for your mercy, for your grace, for your will to be done. We thank you, Father. We know that your word falls on good ground and that your people will be strengthened and it will draw those out of darkness and into your marvelous light. It's in the name of Jesus Christ we pray. And all God's people said, Amen. 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 I want to speak to you today on a message entitled, Only One Gospel. Only One Gospel. In Romans 1, 16 through 17, Paul says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes, for the Jew first, and also for the Greek. For in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. Now, this verse 17 was an eye-opener many, many years ago, over 500 years ago, for a man named Martin Luther. Uh, he was a, a Catholic monk, a priest, so to speak, and he was in charge by the Vatican to search the scriptures, and he was, a, he was the head theologian. And when he came across this verse right here, Romans 1, 17, for in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith, as is written, the just shall live by faith. He said that that was an eye-opener for him. And what happened was, is it gave birth to the Reformation, meaning he broke away from the Catholic Church, and the Protestant movement began. Many of what, of what your faith is in today, and it goes back to the biblical faith, of, of believing that we are saved by grace alone, that we are saved by faith alone in Christ, not by works, not by anything that you do. It's by faith alone in Jesus Christ. Now, I believe that that is the pure gospel of Jesus. Amen? Say amen. It is, because that is what the Bible teaches. Now, what we need to understand, though, is that today, over 500 plus years later, this gospel is once again perverted. Many have added works to your salvation, or they will say you're saved by faith, and so therefore you can live any way you want to. It does not matter. You're saved because you have a faith in Christ. And, and that is wrong as well. And so the Bible says that we are saved so that we may do good works to glorify our Father in heaven. But we're not saved by anything that we can do. We're only saved by faith. But again, this has been a perverted gospel. And many, many people today worship a Jesus that is not the biblical Jesus. Many people have made up a Jesus in their mind that will justify their sinful lifestyle, that will justify their complacency and their lukewarmness. And that is not the biblical Jesus. And sadly, one day, you will be face to face with the biblical Jesus and you will have to give an account for why your name is not written in the Lamb's book of life because you truly did not believe in the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now the gospel means good news and the good news is this. There is no one righteous, no, not one, but Christ, God in the flesh came. He died, he rose from the dead physically to pay for the penalty of sin once and for all, the past, the present, and the future. Now, you may say, Michael, I've heard this message many times. But if you've heard this message many times, you should get excited every time you hear this message because it is the greatest message that has ever been told. It is still the living word of God. It's the promise. It's the blessing of God. And this is the only gospel that saves, that sets captives free. You're going through trials. You're going through tribulations. But it does not take God by surprise. It absolutely does not. And the devil has been warned through scripture that his demise is coming to an end. It's soon coming. His end is coming. His destruction is coming. His judgment is coming. 
And the Bible says, Woe to the earth, for he is filled with fury, for he has been cast down. And woe to the inhabitants of the earth, because he has declared war on the saints most high, those who hold to the testimony of Jesus Christ. And one thing Satan does is he will take that testimony of Christ, which is in your heart, and he can pervert it. He did it to Adam. He did it to Eve. He took the word of God that God had placed in their heart in the Garden of Eden, and he said, did God really say this? And when you open up the Bible, you say, did God really mean this? Does God really mean that? And we begin to live like Adam and Eve, where we don't believe in God anymore for his provision we don't believe in God anymore for his his sustenance you know for he sustains things in our life all of us have failed God I have failed God I pray I never fail God again but all I can do is be faithful to him and to him alone and to be faithful to his message that we are saved by faith and it we shall live by faith it is faith that draw, drew you to listen to this message right now. It is faith that draws you to the, to the assembly of the church. I'm telling you, I'm telling you, I cannot possibly put together in an entire message this morning what, what is on my heart. But what does God want us to hear? I believe it will be spoken. In Galatians 1, 6 through 10, Paul continues to write in a different book. He says, I marvel that you are turning away so soon from him who called you in the grace of Christ to a different gospel. This was true in Paul's day, and it's true in our day today as well. So many people are turning away from the true gospel of Jesus Christ. Why? Because we don't like it because we don't agree with it, because it, the true gospel of Christ will convict us of our sinful our, our habits, our bad habits. And so we, we easily want to give room to something that is false. And we'll be happy with that. We'll be satisfied with that. And this is the greatest poison your spirit could ever take part in. Verse 7, he says, It is not another, but there are some who trouble you and want to pervert the gospel of Christ. We have to understand that in Paul's day and in our day, there are people who deliberately pervert the word of God. They deliberately pervert the word of God. They are doing this on purpose because they hate God. There are God haters in this world. And many of them are in the pulpits across this nation today. They hate God. They claim to love him. If you read the book of Jude, if you read the book of 2 Peter, if you read the book of, of, of 2 Thessalonians, where they talk about false teachers in our day, in the day of the church, they're rampant. They're needed today. Everyone is looking for a teacher, but it's false. They don't want to go to the great teacher. And so we'll seek after men for their approval, for their wisdom. We'll go from this teacher to that teacher to that teacher when we should fall on our knees in our own home, in our own privacy, and say, Jesus, you are my teacher. You know, we look at the Bible. What did the Apostle Paul do when he first became a Christian? They put him away for three years in his home to learn directly from Jesus Christ, the written word of God. Three years later, he was called up by Barnabas to go out and to become an evangelist. Many of us do not have the patience to just sit under Christ and stay under Christ. We'd want to, we want to hop on YouTube. We want to believe people with eternal truths whom we have never, ever met. And just because they say Jesus is Lord, you think they are men and women of God? Paul dealt with this in his own day. In verse 8, it says, But even if we or an angel from heaven preaches another gospel to you, that what we have preached to you, let him be accursed. So many people sadly today in the church are under a curse. And you know what the curse means? It means that God is dissatisfied with you. God, God is, God, you are separated from God. You're under a curse. And, and Paul is saying, look, now, now let's go into real time with this, mess, this verse right here. Paul is saying, even if we, meaning there's a possibility that even we apostles, he says, could go away from the truth and start preaching a false gospel. You see, Paul even mentioned that. Paul even said, or an angel from heaven. And what happened? That's how the Mormons' belief was created. Where Joseph Smith was encountered by an angel. And he began to 
to write the Book of Mormon because an angel from heaven told him to write the Book of Mormon. And today, millions upon millions upon millions of people are, are going to an eternal place of separation, the lake of fire, because they believe what an angel said, when we should believe in what the Son of God has said through his written word. It is finished. It is finished. And not only that, but we think about Jehovah Witnesses. So sad. It's so close to my heart. I have family who are Jehovah Witnesses. But they believe, they believe that, that, that they were spoken to by a prophetic voice. And, and, and they came out in the 1800s as the Mormons in the 1800s. And today they lead millions and millions astray with a different gospel. And what are we doing? What are we doing as Christians? We have the gospel, or at least I hope we do. I pray we do. But Paul is saying, you're under a curse. Does it concern you that, if you, that you might be under a curse if you don't know the true gospel of Christ? In verse 9, it says, As we have said before, so now I say again, if anyone preaches to you another gospel than what you have received, let him be cursed. There are so many that preach a different gospel, even in churches today. You know why there are so many churches in America? Because there are so many different gospels. And therefore, they are, many are under a curse. Why do you think there's so much division in churches? Why do you think there's so much flesh going on in the church? And I'm talking about how we do things in worship where we incorporate worldly things. Because we are not listening to the true gospel that will convict our hearts and set us free. We're, we're so quick to run to man for his opinion. We're so quick to run to psychiatrists, psychologists. We're so quick to run to, to organizations that, that have counseling and, and they have nothing to do with the gospel of Christ. Nothing to do. And that's why many are so messed up and under a curse. Because the Bible clearly says... If we preach, if another gospel is preached to you, you're accursed. This is New Testament scripture. And this is where many of you will probably not want to hear the rest of this message. I'm not standing here judging people. I'm standing here preaching what the word of God says. We come into the house of God casually, not on fire for God, just to say, oh, I'm just checking off this God. I'm, I'm trying to do the best I can. Well, you know, you keep trying and you'll keep failing. We're not called to try. We're called to trust. What does the word say? The just shall live by faith. Say it with me. The just shall live by faith. That has nothing to do with trying. It has to do with trusting. It has to do with trusting in God. Somebody told me last week, Pastor, I'll be there at the church. I just need to get some things right. I says, I'll never see you in church. Because as long as you're trying, you'll never make it. You're called to trust. The Lord told me that after 15 years of backsliding. I said, Lord, I've been trying. And he said, I never called you to try. I called you to trust in me. The just shall live by faith. Now, in verse 9, Galatians 1, 9, he says, As we have said before, so now I say again, If anyone preaches another gospel to you than the one we have you have received, let him be accursed. For do I now persuade men or God? Or do I seek to please men? For if I still pleased men, I would not be a bondservant of Christ. You have to understand something. You need to make up your mind. Are you going to serve Christ? Or are you going to serve men? So many of these churches serve men. The will of the pastor. The agendas of the pastor. That's what these churches serve. And those churches are full, by the way. They're full of the devil. They're full of lust. They're full of, they're full of worldly wisdom, demonic powers. And, and it follows them to their home when they leave the church services. And that's why the homes are in turmoil. That's why the homes are in division. That's why their homes are in, in strife and hatred towards one another. That's why homes are in confusion. And that's why, there's no, that's why there's no peace of God. There's no joy of the Lord. Because you're a bondservant once again to sin and not to Christ. This is what a different gospel will do in your life. This is what a different gospel will do in your church. 1 Corinthians 16, 22. If anyone does not love the Lord, Jesus Christ, let him be accursed. O Lord, come. Again, let's read that. 
If anyone does not love the Lord Jesus Christ, let him be accursed. O Lord, come. Amen? This is scripture. Do we love the Lord? If we do, if we do not love the Lord, we're under a curse. And what does Jesus say in John 14? If you love me, obey my commandments. And by obeying his commandments, you're in the true gospel. It's not works, but it's faith. You're going to believe what the written word of God says. And not under your own interpretation or even under, your, the, under the interpretation of me. But you're going to be a student of the word of God. You're going, to be a, you're going to study the word. If you don't study the Bible, you're in trouble. If you don't study the Bible for yourself on a regular basis, you're in trouble. Because you will easily be deceived. And don't think, no, I cannot. Adam and Eve they had the very presence of God, yet they were deceived by this very sneaky snake, this serpent. And he knows how to deceive the hearts of men. Yes, he is a punk, he is a coward, but he is a force to be reckoned with. And we can only fight this good fight of faith through the power of the Holy Spirit. Why is it that you're still under confusion? Why is it that you're still under bondage? Because you believe in the things that your eyes see, the activity of Satan, and not living by faith in the trusting in the Lord Jesus Christ. But men have perverted the word of God. They're still perverting the word of God. Galatians 5, 7 through 10 says this. You ran well. Who hindered you from obeying the truth? Again, John 14, Jesus says, if you love me, obey my commands. And how do you know what the commands of Christ are? Open up your Bible. Begin to study the word from Genesis to Revelation. And you'll learn what the truth is. You don't need me to teach you the truth. You have the Holy Spirit. You have the Holy Spirit. But if you don't have the Holy Spirit... Look, look here's what I'm going to tell you. And I'm going to be very blunt. If you call yourself a Christian, you're led by the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit will daily direct you to the written word of God. And if that's not happening, you're not being led by the Holy Spirit. The failure does not come from the Holy Spirit. The failure comes from you. Because the Word of God says, do not quench the Spirit of God. And you can quench the Spirit of God by saying, I would rather work an extra shift. I would rather go play baseball. I would rather go to the gym. I would rather sit and watch TV, Andy Griffith show, whatever it is then get into the written word of God. And when we do that again and again and again and again and again, we're not obeying the truth. We, we, and when you don't obey the truth, watch, you forget the truth. That is so important to understand. When, when, you, when you don't obey it, you'll forget it. And when you're not in the word, the word will become faint to you. It'll go away and, and, it, and it'll dissolve. Because it's the living word. It's the living word. You want to hear from your father daily. And that is what will direct you into the truth, into the true gospel. There's only one gospel, and it's right there in the Bible. Now, you got to be careful about the Bibles. The NIV, I do not agree with that version at all. The New International Version, it's been corrupted. It's been translated so many different times. They're taking out gender synonyms, uh, uh, gender um, translation for male and female. They're taking all that out. I mean, they're changing it all up. It, it's a woke Bible. I'm sorry, but it is. You know, there are some good Bibles out there, the King James, the New King James Version. The, there's even the, the New American Standard Bible, NASB. That is a very good standard word-for-word -word translation. But you need to do your homework on Bibles. There are many translations out there because there are many people who want to make a buck off of the greatest selling book in the world. Amen. So you need to be mindful of the Bible that you're reading too. Let the Holy Spirit give you discernment on that. Amen. Amen. Look, let's read this again. Galatians 5, 7 through 10. It says, you ran well. Amen. Who hindered you from obeying the truth? Paul is speaking to Christians who were 
chasing a false gospel. Verse 8, this persuasion does not come from him who calls you. Meaning it's not, it's not the fault of God. It's not the fault of Jesus. It's not the fault of the Holy Spirit. Look, verse 9, a little leaven, leavens, a little, a little leaven leavens the whole lump. What does that mean? It means be careful who you're hanging with. Be careful who you're associated with. Be careful of the church that you're going to. Who persuaded you? Was it God? He said, no, it was not God. It's the people you're hanging around with. When your house, house is filled, when your house is filled with, with the ungodly things of this world, when your house is filled with people who come in and out and they take your, your walk with Christ for granted, I mean, a little living, it rub off on you. A, a little world will rub off on you. And you become to get distracted by things. And the next thing you know, your relationship with God is in, in jeopardy. It's in trouble. A and then Paul will be telling you who hindered you from obeying the truth. Because now you're giving into the things of the flesh. This is what happens when we don't honor the true gospel when we don't be mindful of the things that are around us we're all like sponges now yes as christians we're called to to we have to be around unbelievers because if not how will they get saved but there's a difference between ministering to them and being entertained by them and we have to have the discernment of the spirit of god on that we really do Verse 10, it goes on to say, I have confidence in you, in the Lord, that you will have no other mind, but he who troubles you shall bear his judgment, whoever he is. See, Paul is saying, the Lord knows who he is, and there's judgment coming to those who have hindered you from obeying the truth. God is going to deal with these people. And if you stick with these people, God will deal with you too. But you must separate yourself. 2 Corinthians 6. What does light and darkness have in common? Nothing. Have nothing to do with these wicked things. It's not just talking about the things of the world. It's also, sadly, talking about people. You know, our first priority, and this is something that I had to learn early on. Our first priority as a Christian is the body of Christ. Because in doing that, we're honoring Jesus. We're honoring Jesus. And, you know, all of us have brothers and sisters worldly, you know, of the flesh. But what makes you and I brothers and sisters? The blood of Jesus. And that overrules everything because that is eternal. And one thing I see, my heart hurts, is because I see more and more, not just in this church, but in many of Bible-believing churches, I see more and more Christians not being faithful to the fellowship not being faithful to church fellowship you know I had brother Jason told me you know brother Jason and Miss Kimberly they would love nothing more than to be here right now but they're dealing with some situations in their home and God is with them and the Holy Spirit is with them it's nothing that no their marriage is not in trouble nothing like that but they have a family member that needs their help who's suffering from illness and they cannot leave their family member alone. They're dying to be here. They would love to be here. Their hearts are here, but they have to deal with this situation at home. And Brother Jason says, man, I just, I cannot, he told me, because I cannot understand how people could just sit at home as Christians and watch church on TV. That can't, I can't handle that. That does not good enough for me. And I'm not boasting in these people, but I think God brings people to give us a lesson. He comes all the way from Laporte over an hour drive, and he's here on time. He's here when he's supposed to be here. And, and he loves the fellowship. He goes, hey, every, every Wednesday, he'll text me, Pastor, I can't make it to prayer. But I know he's not able to make it. It's such a distance. And what he's dealing with. And so because he, he loves the church, and you and I, we, should, we, should, we need to love the church because in doing so, we love Jesus. Amen. You know, Christians need encouragement too. And the greatest way we can encourage each other is by being there for each other. I'm thinking of a brother whose wife is in a hospital right now. 
and she needs your prayers. She's facing a life or death situation. And the greatest thing we could do is just love them. And just love them. Your Christian life is not about you. But see, false gospels and the churches in America, they teach that the gospel is about you. And that's not true. The gospel is about others. Jesus said, I come to serve, not to be served. And so as we as Christians, we wake up every day and we're serving Christ every day. Every day we're called to make a difference in the life of, of, of the family of God. It begins there first. Jesus said, the world will know my disciples by the love they have for one another. In Acts 15, 1, it says, while Paul and Barnabas were at Antioch of Syria, some men from Judea arrived and began to teach the believers, saying, unless you are circumcised as required by the law of Moses, you cannot be saved. Now, you know what this is, right? We're adults here. I'm just going to be blunt. Circumcision. Circumcision. That was required to be a Jew in the day. And these men were coming from Judea saying, uh, this message that Paul's preaching, hey, the only way you're going to get saved from your sin, men, you need, to, you need to get circumcised. You need to continue in the law of Moses. This was false gospel. Like today. Like today. Look, look, look. We don't need to be circumcised today to be saved. Do we? Do we? See, circumcision was a part of the law of Moses. Just like many Christians today believe and, and, I, and I'm sorry, but many Christians believe today that, that you have to worship God on Saturday, honor the Sabbath, not realizing that Scripture clearly teaches that to honor the Sabbath doesn't mean that you worship on Saturday. It means that you're in Christ because He is the Lord of the Sabbath. And when you have a relationship with Christ, you're honoring the Sabbath because the rest is in Him now. The rest of God is in Him, in Christ. And so when you're in Christ, you're honoring the Sabbath. But sadly, a lot of Christians do not understand that. And they resort back to the law of Moses, just like these guys did. They resorted back to the law of Moses. And in your wisdom, you're fooling yourself. You're not being led by the Holy Spirit of God. And, and this, is, this, is, this is biblical, guys. But do you see what a false gospel can do? It could resort you back to works. And it's not about works. It's about faith. And so if I do not worship God on Sabbath, on Saturday, then I too cannot be saved because I'm not honoring the Sabbath. It's about faith. When we are in Christ, every day is the Sabbath. And this is what divides churches. That's what false gospels do. It keeps you from being a part of the true body of Christ. I'm not here to please you, men. I'm here to please God. And if you have a problem with what I say, you need to pray to God and talk to him about this. Here we are bickering and divide, divisive about things like this when we should know the true teachings of Christ. While right, we're doing this, the world is out there going to hell. Churches are empty. This church needs help. You're a Christian. You're called by God to serve. What are you doing? You just come here and warm up the pews? It's like that in all the churches in America, the Bible-believing churches. They just come and warm up the pews. I know. I used to play baseball for many years. I never wanted to ride the bench. Put me in, coach. I'm ready. You know? I was passionate. I remember one time I struck out. I got so mad. I was going back to the dugout. I got my helmet and I threw it against the bench and I came home from a game that day and my, my coach who was also a Marine got in contact with my dad and said my dad said if you ever do that again <laughs> he got on to me you know I'm supposed to represent the family that's unsportsmanlike conduct but I did not want to ride the bench I wanted to be in the game you know, I wanted to be, you know, doing something. If I signed up to play baseball, I want to play baseball. And if I signed up to, sign, to follow Christ, I'm going to follow Christ. 
You may make some mistakes along the way, but you keep going forward and you learn from those things and you grow and you grow and you'll give glory to God. And I want to give glory to God. And I hope you want to give glory to God. But if not, get out of the way. God will bring somebody else in. And the same goes for me. Hey, we have our marching orders. Paul and Barnabas were over here preaching at Antioch, where they first began to call believers Christians. And these heathens, unbelievers, come in and say, no, 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 no. You need to be circumcised to be saved. I don't need to know the exact character of Paul to know this, but I'm sure Paul wanted to slap them upside the head. Paul was the type of man who uh, did not give any type of room for this kind of mess. And I believe we need a few men like that in the church. I believe we need a few women like that in the church. And the church is worldwide. We need people who will, who will stand up for truth, who will defend the gospel. Not that it needs defending, but we will defend it because it saved us. It brought us into a relationship with the Lord. The gospel, there's only one gospel. And when people in the churches pervert the gospel, when people in the churches preach another gospel, that should burn within you. It did to Jesus. He walked into the temple. He said, it is written, my house shall be a house of prayer. But you've turned it into a den of thieves and robbers. He said, you take advantage of the church. You're making a profit off of the church. He said, you take this place for granted. And he whipped those animals out of the cages and he overturned the money changers tables because he was fed up with this stuff. And I believe if Christ walked amongst us today, he would do the same thing again in the churches. We need to evaluate our church. We need to evaluate our walk with Christ. Every single one of us. Is Christ welcome in our church? Is, is his message being preached? Are we loving him with all our mind, body, and soul? 2 Corinthians 2.17 Paul says, you see, we are not like the many hucksters. Let's bring this up. 2 Corinthians 2.17 you see, we are not like the many hucksters who preach this for personal profit. Amen? We preach the word of God with sincerity and with Christ's authority, knowing that God is watching us. Amen? Amen. 2 Corinthians 2.17. Now, Paul in his day was saying there were many, many hucksters. And there still are many hucksters today. And I know... I know you know who they are. They're for personal wealth, personal profit. They're making money with the word of God because they know money could be made. They look at the Bible, number one selling book of all time. We can make some money off of this. We can create our own religion. We can create our own denomination. We don't have to, we don't have to be a, a part of, the, of, of all this other stuff. I mean, going to college, man, we can just get us a ministry and go with it call ourselves prophet call ourselves the apostle thousands upon thousands of them like that Paul admitted there were many look look can you pull that up please 2 Corinthians 2.17 do you have that 2 Corinthians 2.17 I want, I want to look at this look it says you see we are not like the many hucksters Many. Catch that word, many. And that's in the King James of I'm reading out of NLT. It's okay. We are not so as many. Look at that word, many. Many, right there. Many. Paul said, in the last days, there will be many, many false teachers. They will, and people will come after them, and they will tickle their ears. Many. There will be many. Now, when, the, when they say many in the Bible whether it's the King James or the NLT, they're saying many. It's going to be a lot. It's a lot. Look, 
We preach the word of God with sincerity and with God's authority, knowing that God is watching us. God's watching us. Michael, God is watching you. Michael, God is watching what you say. Guard your words, guard your heart, guard your mind. Guard your hands, guard your feet. Watch what you do, Michael. Many can fall if you fall. Deuteronomy 4.2 You shall not add to the word which I command you, nor take from it, that you may keep the commandment of the Lord your God which I command you. Cherish the word of God, the written word of God. It's not just a book that props up the lamp on your nightstand. It's not just a book, a paperweight. It's the written word of God. It's the eternal truth of God. It's the eternal blessings of God. But yet we're not in it. We don't cherish it. We don't honor it. You know, many of you have a phone where you can find out how much, how long you've been on this app, on that app, on that app, and this app. Compare it to how much you've been under the Bible in your phone. Facebook has about, what? You've been on Facebook four hours. Five hours in a 24-hour period. But you're in the Bible five minutes. Does that make sense? Does it make sense? And we call ourselves Christians? The Lord told them in the early days, Put the word on the doorposts. Hang it in your wall. Let the word be in your heart. Let it be in your mind. Let it be everywhere, all throughout your house. And yeah, we, we, can, hang up, we can hang up pictures of the Lord is good in our walls, in our homes. And it just doesn't mean nothing anymore. Just like in the Supreme Court, we had the Ten Commandments, but it don't mean nothing no more. So we need to take this down. We need to remove this. And might as well just remove those things from our homes too. Because it's just... Uh, it's just decorative, decorative things now. It doesn't really mean nothing to us anymore, does it? I see that. So many Christians, so many people calling themselves Christians, but yet they're out fishing today. They're out at the beach having fun today. While other Christians who are holding on to the faith are at the church wondering, where's my brothers and sisters? Now, granted, we have a lot of people out today because they had to go visit family. I'm not talking about them. I'm not talking about them. But there are many, many churches where they have members saying, where's my brothers and sisters? Don't they know that this is what, uh, for such a time, God has called us together? Don't you remember Hebrews 10, 25? Let us not forsake the fellowship of some are in the habit of doing, but let us gather together and encourage each other as we see the day of the Lord approaching. It encourages. I know I'm encouraging you. You're encouraging me. But those online, there are some that can't make it. I think of Brother Louis Hicks. He cannot make it because his wife, she's very, very sick. But he watches online. And he lives far away from here. He sent me a message Friday night. He says, and, he, and I showed Brother Jason and Brother Eric uh, this. I said, he said, I have never heard the book of Acts 2 uh, explain it that way. Thank you. God bless you. Keep up the good work. It was a blessing to us. It was a blessing to us. It encourages us. Because when you see a church that's almost empty and not too many people watching online, hey, somebody's getting it. Amen. Amen. And so we encourage each other. We all need encouragement. God will encourage you, yes, but we do need encouragement from each other. There's much work to be done. But the true gospel teaches you this, but the false gospel does not teach you this. It says, have your best life today. The false gospel teaches you that, you know what? Hey, how can God bless you? Where the true gospel says, how can you bless God? How can you bless others? I thank God I'm surrounded by faithful people here at Grace Christian Center. They're always willing to serve above and beyond. They serve in several ministries. And I see they're tired. I see they're, sometimes they're overwhelmed with life and with work. I see that. And they're hanging on. 
And the Lord, only thing holding them is their faith. And that's all they need. Their faith. I like what Pastor Carter Conlon said. He said, prayer keeps the doors open. The church doors, that is. Made me cry years ago when I first heard that sermon. He said, prayer is what keeps the church doors open. But yet many Christians underestimate the power of prayer because they don't even show up. This message is for, it's for anyone who the Holy Spirit is speaking to today. I love, I love you with all my heart. I do. My wife, we love y'all with all of our heart. But this is not targeted at anybody. This is, this is truly what the Lord is putting on my heart to speak. You know, I thank God because I remember when we had prayer services here uh, in 2007, 2008, 2009, when it was just three or four of us for all those years praying at prayer night. It used to be Monday nights then. For four years, it was just four, four or five of us. And there were lonely times, but yet there were times of, of testing. And today we have 20 plus people come to prayer. I praise God for that. I don't ever forget those things. But I believe the house of God should be full. The most important day the church ever gathers is the prayer service. I believe that. I believe that. What did Paul say? He said in Galatians 5, 7, he says, who, you who ran well, who hindered you from obeying the truth? Recognize your enemies. Recognize the enemies of God. Recognize the distractions in your life. Recognize the obstacles in your life. And recognize God in your life. Recognize the voice of the Holy Spirit in your life. In Revelation 22, 18 through 19, again, the word commands us about the value of the written word of God. It says, for I testify to everyone. Thank you, Heidi. To everyone who hears the words of the prophecy of this book. If anyone adds to these things, God will add to him the plagues that are written in this book. And if anyone takes away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God shall take away from his part of the book of life, from the holy city and from the things which are written in this book. You must not add or take away from the book of the Bible. We are to be a people who honor the Bible. It's in our hearts and we preach and we live by what the Word of God says. And you have to go home and you have to be a student of the Word of God for yourself. Turn off the media, turn off the TVs, turn off everything and study the Word of God for yourself. Just read, just read and say, Holy Spirit, help me to have that spirit of remembrance. And just read and study the word and you'll, the spirit of God will begin to be your teacher. He will show you the things that you need to know. And just be patient and just read. But there is a warning that comes with this. If we take this gospel and pervert it or add to it, take away from it, there is judgment for that. Does that scare you? It scares me. It really does. Every time I say, Lord, please guide my words. And I'm like, Lord, I know a pastor has 15 years. I know I have failed you. And I know I've even said some things in the pulpit that I should not have said because sometimes I said something in the flesh. And sometimes I, and I know, Lord, but that's what I love about God, about Jesus, that if you come to him with a, a right heart, he will forgive you. He will show you your way. And he will show you in the way in which you must go. Because he is faithful. And that is why we worship Jesus. Because he'll never leave us. He sent us his Holy Spirit. And it's the Holy Spirit who opens the truth of the word of God. And it, when that happens, it brings you into the true gospel of Jesus Christ. Sadly, Sadly, so many mega churches out there, and not just mega churches, but Bible believing churches. I'm sorry, uh, small churches. They're not Bible believing churches. And people flood to these things because they have the programs for their kids. 
They have all the good volunteers there, plenty of volunteers there, and they want their kids to be in that kind of uh, environment. Well, it'll be fun for them. I, I, I'm, I'm shook to the core of a church up in North Houston. They have a, a, a commercial on TV, and they say, come to church. Come to church where, where, where you're going to grow. Church is it's what needed in our life. Church is what's needed in our families. I mean, come and learn the, the, the values of, 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 of church. And, and we have exciting programs for the kids, engaging messages for the adults. And they're showing their church and everything. Not one single word mention of Jesus Christ. Not one not one. Why? Because you're afraid if they watch on TV and they hear Jesus, oh, we don't want to go to that. What did Paul say? Pull this up, Romans 1, 16, 17. Please. Romans 1, 16, 17. Paul says, for I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God. Amen. When you come to this church, you're going to know what you're getting. Amen? Jesus Christ is before me. He's behind me. He's all around me. And I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. There's a cross at the very front of that property. Many churches will not dare put a cross at the front of their property because it's offensive. Yes, it's offensive. But it is the power of God that says that Jesus loved you all of you, all lives matter. All nations, all races. You come as you are, but you will leave in the image of God, in Christ. That is what the true gospel does. And I'm not ashamed of this. That preacher up in North Houston may be ashamed of it. He's being a friendly seeker church. And all he's doing is just making people feel comfortable as they go to hell. Because there's no transforming power of Jesus Christ being preached or displayed. Do you hear me this morning, church? Amen. And this breaks my heart. Because there are many people out there who, who want answers. But they put up with it because they think this is the right way. I, 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 I've gone to a restaurant that we enjoy, Ana and I go to, and she's from China. One of the nicest ladies you'd ever meet. And she came to China several, um, to America several years ago from China. She worked hard, she works hard. And they have a restaurant, her family, and she said one day to us, um, what do I do? And I told her, we're pastors of a church. And she goes, oh. And we began to talk, and she would see some of our church members from church go there. And she began to say that she goes to church too. And come to find out, she's been going to the Kingdom Hall, Jehovah Witness. And she believes that this is the truth. And I looked at Anna because Anna was, knows this. Anna was raised with this. And here's someone who comes from China, know nothing about, if you know, they, they don't know. And she's never heard of Jesus or the Bible, but, but it's not the biblical Jesus that she's been told. And so we talk to her, we plant the word to her, and, and we're hoping, we're praying that that God will intervene while there's still time. So it's not just about going out and having a meal. We saw how God is faithful and, and, and brings us in alignment with, in the paths of other people who are searching. And she says, I'm searching right now. I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm just going there because I'm searching. And I gave her the invitation to come, to come and listen, to, for us to come and sit with her in her home, to talk to her. And so keep that in prayer. But there are many who, who are looking for, for answers. In my last scripture, 
I'm sorry, let me read this real quickly. 2 Corinthians 3, 4. 2 Corinthians 11, 3, 4. Paul says, But I fear lest somehow, as the serpent deceived Eve by his craftiness, so your minds may be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. For if he who comes preaching preaches another Jesus, whom we have not preached, or if you receive a different spirit, which you have not received, or a different gospel, which you have not accepted, you may well put up with it. He says that people put up with this. You accept it, a different gospel. It's easily done. The, the scripture teaches us that. You put up with it. I remember there's a man who has a men's ministry. And we had a sharp division between us because he allowed a man to come into his men's ministry to preach a different Jesus. Not a biblical Jesus. And, and, and he asked, why are you not coming to the meeting? I said, because. And I told him straight up, because you are not, you're allowing somebody to come in to preach a different Jesus. He goes, oh man, well, you know, it's, it's not like that. Yeah, it is like that. I said, would you allow a Mormon or a, a Jehovah Witness to come into your Christian meetings and preach? He's like, no. I said, well, you should. You, you, you should because you're doing this. You're allowing this man to come in to preach a different Jesus, not of the Bible. But they put up with it. That's what he just said. Scripture says you put up with it. It's real. It's there. It's happening before our very eyes. So let's close this. Listen to the words of Paul as he brings this all to a closure. 1 Thessalonians 2, 4 through 13. I'm just going to read this. He says, but as we have been approved by God to be entrusted with the gospel, even so we speak, not as pleasing men, but God who tests our hearts. For neither at any time did we use flattering words, as you know, nor a cloak for covetousness. God is a witness. Nor did we seek glory from men, either from you or from others. When we might have made demands as apostles of Christ, but we were gentle among you, just as a nursing mother cherishes her own children. So, affectionately longing for you, we were well pleased to impart to you not only the gospel of God, but also our own lives, because you had become dear to us. You see that? For you remember, brethren, our labor and toil for laboring night and day that we might not be a burden to any of you. We preach to you the gospel of God. You are witnesses, and God also, how devoutly and justly and blamelessly we behaved ourselves among you who believe. As you know how we exhorted and comforted and charged every one of you, as a father does his own children, that you would walk worthy of God who calls you into his own kingdom and glory. For this reason, we also thank God without ceasing, because when you received the word of God, which you heard from us, you welcomed it not as the word of men, but as it is in truth, the word of God, which also effectively works in you who believe. The most precious thing, Christian, not preacher, but to the Christian you can do is to deliver the word of God. And you do it in so many ways. Not just what you're saying, but how you're living. And what you're doing. You bring forth the word of God and you serve them and you love them. And this is the heart of Paul. He sacrificed his life for the birth of the church. For what we have today. He gave his life to that. And that is what the true gospel teaches us that we come to serve and not to be served. And it involves not just, oh, I'm part of ministry, I'll be there Monday, Wednesday, Fridays. No, it's so much deeper than that. It's so much deeper. Paul said it's night and day they labored and toiled. It's 24-7 that you walk with Jesus. Jesus said, walk with me daily. Daily. Now, that is what the true gospel teaches and as you study the word, you'll further know what the true gospel is. But be not deceived. 
for we are living in the most deceiving times in the history of the world. And I pray that the Spirit of God will keep you too. In Jesus' name, give God praise in his house. Amen.